Massachusetts, Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Mark from the States, how are we doing today? I am doing fantastic. I hope you are as well. Thank you so much for coming today. The Imperial War Museum of London and Forgotten History. Uh, this is by the History Guy. Uh, there's just something about this guy. Yes, he's American. I'm just going to put that out there. I know that kind of bugs some, some of you. Uh, please give this guy a chance. Uh, for me... It's some nostalgia when I listen to him because he reminds me of a guy that I used to be on car rides with my father. And he would always listen to this one news channel on the radio and they would have a segment where this guy named Paul Harvey would come out and he would tell some anecdotal story with history and kind of a weird ending and just like a huh kind of a story, you know, and this guy reminds me of that and it takes me back to to thinking of those car rides with my father many 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 years ago and so i have kind of a soft spot for this guy plus i find his stuff really good and if you could just give him a chance i think you might find it really good too um so imperial war museum london forgotten history please go support his channel if you could for me please like it if you dare subscribe, um, come sit on this big fake couch. Hopefully you haven't seen this and we can learn something together. This is about uh, Imperial War Museum of London and forgotten history. Back in July, I was invited by the world famous Tank Museum in Dorset to film an episode of their fantastic series, Top 5 Tanks. Oh, that is cool. It was an honor to be invited. They are truly great people who are passionate about what they do. Please go subscribe to their YouTube channel. Consider supporting them on Patreon and watch the History Guy episode of Top 5 Tanks, where we I truly do. put a History Guy spin on the topic. Watch it and share it with your friends. But the visit gave me the opportunity to bring together a couple of old friends who also love history and spend a few days exploring some of the rich history of Wales, South Central England, and finally, some time in London. For starters, like any city, it's not easy to find parking in London. You can get around well by train if you don't mind the crowds and, last July, the oppressive heat, but downtown parking can be hard to find, often full, and seems always to be facing the wrong direction down the street. Not that I mind driving around London. When we did finally find a place to park, it was almost a museum in itself of, well, really expensive cars, like this Bentley Mulzine, which lists for like 240,000 pounds, wow. or this classic hey, Shelby, Shelby Mustang, or this convenient side-by-side -side comparison of the Bentley and the Rolls Royce. You never know what you're going to find in London. We had trouble pulling my buddy Brad out of the car park. Been to London several times, but there's just so much to see that I've been slowly kicking through a list of all the museums. Come on, he's wearing a really cool bow tie. I mean, he's got to get props for that. Come on. Museums that I want to go to. I was still jazzed about buying my new hat, which by then was being mailed directly to Illinois when we popped off to the Imperial War Museum. I've been to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford a couple of times, which has an astounding collection of Duxford. aircraft and armored vehicles, some of which have been featured in episodes of The History Guy. I highly recommend the museum, especially if you're an aircraft enthusiast. It is the aircraft version of the tank museum. But the Imperial War Museum has many facilities, and one that I'd been wanting to see was the flagship museum in London. The museum is located south of the Thames in a part of the city that's called Southwark, which is actually spelled Southwark, but when it comes to place names, the British doggedly refuse to speak English. <laughs> The museum moved to the current building in 1936, but on the portico are the words Henry VIII, Rege, Fundatum Civium Largitas Perfectus, which means, roughly, the King Henry VIII Foundation for the Achievement of the Bounty of the Citizens. And that strikes me as a bit odd. Henry VIII ruled from 1509 to 1547, so why is his name on a building for a museum that was founded in 1917, who moved into that building in 1930 at a building that was built in 1815? It doesn't make any sense. But when I did the research, I found out that it's a really interesting story that goes all the way back to the Crusades, the Holy Land, and has something to do with ducks. As with everything in that ancient city, the mere bricks have history. And being the history guy, well, I believe that that history deserves to be remembered. 
In 1247, King Henry III of England authorized the Crusader Order of Our Lady of Bethlehem to open a priory in London on land that had been donated by the former Sheriff of London. The purpose of the priory, which was subordinate to the Bishop of Jerusalem, was to raise alms for the Crusader Church. The alms were needed, as was the connection between London and the Holy Land, because in 1244, the Chorasmian Turks had taken the city of Jerusalem from the Crusaders and subsequently had razed the city. This had a significant effect on the fortunes of the Crusader Church, and especially the Bishop of Jerusalem, who had now moved to Burgundy, France. So the goal, essentially, was to raise money and support for another crusade to again take back Jerusalem. That crusade was led by the French King Louis IX, didn't go as well as it might have expected, and is the subject of another episode of The History Guy. Following the precepts of the Church of Bethlehem, the prior was also used to house the poor. And in the vernacular of the time, any place that was supported by charity in order to help the needy was referred to as a hospital, even though at the time they had no pretension whatsoever of trying to be a place of medicine. And thus, the place was called St. Mary's Bethlehem Hospital. Around 1370, during the Hundred Years' War, King Edward III essentially seized the property and placed it under the patronage of the crown. The reason was that, being subordinate to a French church, he did not want any of the money raised to end up going to the crown of France, with whom England <laughs> was at war. Yes. Possibly as early as the 14th, That's and at least at the start of the 15th century, the Bethlehem Hospital started to be used to house the mente capti, or mentally ill. By the middle of the 15th century, the Bethlehem Hospital specialized in the confinement of the insane. Over time, the name was essentially okay. shortened in the same way that Southwark became Southwark, to be commonly called <laughs> Bedlam. Because of this association with the insane, the term Bedlam came to be known as a state of chaos or madness. In its archaic usage, it was a generic term for an insane asylum. They were called Bedlams, and of course, in its more modern usage, it generally refers to a scene of confusion or uproar. Over time, Bedlam began to become more and more secularized, and by the 15th century, it lost its former connection to the Crusader Church and the Bethlehemites. And it was for that reason that it was one of the few metropolitan hospitals to survive the dissolution of the monasteries in 1530. In 1547, the mayor of London, Sir John Gresham, petitioned Henry VIII to grant the hospital to the city. The petition was only partially granted, but Henry VIII issued a charter that ceded to the city of London the custody, order, and governance of the hospital and of its occupants and revenues. The by then named Bethlehem Royal Hospital operated under that charter until the incorporation of the National Health Service in 1948. Dang. In the 1600s, or at least as early as 1642, Long a time. tavern was built in a part of London called St. George's Fields, named the Dog and Duck. Bear with me, this will all come together in a moment. The tavern was named <laughs> after the sport of duck baiting, which occurred in the adjacent wetlands and consisted of putting out bait for ducks and then releasing dogs to chase them. Quizzically, the sport finally waned not because of the cruelty of the sport, but because its patrons were so rowdy that they would raise a disturbance. Dare I call it, Bedlam. The magistrates of Surrey became concerned that too many people assembled there of very loose character, and that it consequently yeah. became a receptacle for disorderly persons, and a place of assignation destructive of that morality which it was the duty of the law to see preserved, and thus sought not to renew the tavern's license. There was a protracted legal dispute, but the Dog and Duck was finally closed in 1799 and the building demolished in 1812. The inn sign has been preserved at the Cuming Museum on Walworth Road. At the end of the 18th century, the second Bethlehem Hospital building, which had been built in 1676, was collapsing. The massive building had been built without an actual foundation. One no. historian described the old building as resembling a crazy carcass with no wall, still vertical. Maintaining the old building was too expensive, so starting in 1804, the hospital held a fundraising drive and traded the land from the hospital for land at a new site. The new location was in an industrial, overcrowded, swamp-like area of London called St. George's Fields. Yup, right on the location of the former site of the Dog and Duck. Well, that's, that's awesome, I guess, you know. Did it bring back all the people with loose character is that what it was <laughs> that's, that's god that's just so amazing okay coming back full circle here we go thus replacing one form of bedlam for another mm -hmm. the building was built in the neoclassical style and completed in 1815 
Bethlehem Royal Hospital is an important part of London history. Of course, any institution that has been around for nearly 800 years would be. It is one of the oldest mental institutions in the world. It has several times been at the very center of debates and controversies over the treatment of the mentally ill. In fact, there was a scandal as recently as 2014 over the death of a 15-year-old in the adolescent unit that led to reforms. The long history of the institution represents the challenges that societies have faced providing health care to the people. The institution's long history and reputation, including a period of a couple of centuries when members of the public could freely visit the institution and gawk at the inmates, what? a sort of public display of madness that helped fundraise for the hospital, has wow. made it a powerful piece of popular culture, a setting for numerous plays, paintings, books, films, and television shows. Notably among those is a series of paintings by 18th century artist William Hogarth that portray a wealthy merchant's son's decline from wealth into gambling, prostitution, and eventually prison and confinement at Bedlam. The paintings are considered to be the ancestor of the storyboard. The terrifying 1946 stylish B-horror film Bedlam, starring Boris Karloff, is partially set at Bethlehem and based on Hogarth's paintings. And what does this have to do with the Imperial War Museum? The building at St. George's Fields was slowly expanded, and in 1848 a stately dome was added to house the asylum's chapel. But by 1930 the building was simply not large enough, and Bethlehem moved to a suburb where it still operates today. The old building was going to be demolished and turned into a park, but as it turns out, another institution was in need of a new location. That institution was, of course, the Imperial War Museum, which now occupies the central part of what used to be the Bethlehem Royal Hospital. The Latin words, Henry VIII, Rege, Fundatum, Civium, Largitas, Perfectus, on the portico, refer to the 1547 charter that Henry VIII gave to the hospital. From duck baiting to insanity to war, London again exchanged one kind of bedlam for another. another. Yeah. That is one of the things I love about London. Every door you walk through has so much history associated with it. Right. How amazing it is when the museum itself is history. The idea for the Imperial War Museum was first proposed in 1917, while the Great War was still being fought, by a member of Parliament named Sir Alfred Bond, who was first Commissioner of Public Works. The Great War had changed the United Kingdom and brought it into the romanticized ideas of the Victorian age, and the British losses on foreign battlefields had touched virtually every family. Bond said at the museum opening, it was hoped to make the museum so complete That's that so everyone cool. who took part in the war, however obscurely, we find therein an example or illustration of the sacrifice that he or she made. The museum was intended to be a place to collect and preserve materials to illustrate Britain's war effort, and the name Imperial was added at the suggestion of the India and Dominions Committee, who thought the museum should be inclusive of the experience of all who fought in the war under the British flag. The Imperial War Museum now includes five branches. The one I was most familiar with is Imperial War Museum Duxford. Built in the location of one of the United Kingdom's earliest aerodromes, Duxford is Britain's largest aviation museum. But IWM London is rather different and has a more varied collection. Mon said at its dedication in 1920 that it was not a monument of military glory, but a record of toil and sacrifice. The museum focuses on the war experience of both combatants and civilians, much more than, say, campaigns or battles or generals, and so feels different than most military museums, although it does have a truly fantastic military collection. The collection starts on the outside, where the museum displays two giant 15-inch guns, one from HMS Ramleys and one from HMS Resolution, both Revenge-class Super Dreadnought battleships that were built during the First World War and served through the Second World War. The 650-foot-long guns could fire two 1,938-pound projectiles per minute to a distance of around 19 miles. While Ramleys was part of the shore bombardment group during D-Day, this particular gun was not used at Normandy, as this barrel had been removed and replaced in 1941. But the gun from Resolution, which by D-Day had been converted into a training ship, had been fitted to the monitor HMS Roberts and was used in the bombardment supporting the D-Day landings. I was constantly startled at every corner of this museum, whether it was by something spectacular like the front end of a Lancaster bomber or unexpected like the Tamsine, the smallest survivor among the little ships to help evacuate the troops at Dunkirk. It's hard to imagine crossing the English Channel in this fishing boat, not quite 15 foot long, under fire to bring men home. This car in the main gallery was destroyed in a suicide car bombing at Baghdad Market in 2007. This three-inch Smith gun was built for the Home Guard during the invasion scare. It was mounted on two large wheels that could be used to move it, and then when the time came to fight, it would be tipped on its side, with one wheel allowing you to turn the gun and the other providing overhead protection for the crew. 
There were so many things to see and expect some to be highlighted in future episodes wow. of The History Guy. Saddam. The museum roughly starts at World War I on the ground floor, covers World War II on the next floor, and more modern conflicts and special collections above that. There's a Holocaust exhibit on the top floor. It would be too much to give a full description here except to say that the museum is well worth your time if you are a fan of military history, but also if you just want to understand the powerful effect that the World Wars had on the people of the United Kingdom. It is a large museum with a massive collection and plan at least several hours for the visit. That's all my time for the travel log this month. I really did intend to get through more than one museum, but I got so excited studying the history of the building that it took up all my time. That's what it's like in a city that's so full of history that deserves to be remembered. And that's a little bit what it's like to be the history guy. Back in Cool. <laughs> yeah, that was a great video. I loved it. I hope you did too. Has any of... I know. <laughs> Here's a dumb question. First of all, hope everybody's happy, healthy, and safe. And my question is, how many of you have been there? I, I would imagine most of you have been there. I would love to go, and I intend to go. It's definitely on the list for me to visit. I would love to go to Duxford and see all the planes, but I'm not sure if that will happen. The Tank Museum, of course, I, I want to go to. Uh, there's so many museums and just historical sites that I want to see. Um it's just, like I said before, it's just gonna, I'm going to have to end up being there for like a month at least. Or I'm just going to have to move there and live there for a couple years. Anyway, Violet popped in. She's, see, you want to say hello, Violet? There she is. Okay. I know. Camera shy. Um, but, yeah. Cool place. I uh, hope you have a great day. Huh? Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye. Mark from the States. Mark from the States. It's Mark. And he